Hello and welcome to the second part of the series titled Wheels of Death. You may have all seen some catchy slogans on our roads. Speed thrills but kills or a fast drive can be your last drive etc. People often speed up when they are in a hurry. But do they end up reaching their destination on time? We will see this and more in this episode. Let us start with a recap of the first video. We saw that there are three kinds of friction, static, kinetic and rolling. Static friction is the strongest and we need it to get the vehicle rolling and to maneuver your vehicle. We also looked at braking distance, the time it needed for the vehicle to come to a full stop after you have applied your brakes. Today, we will start by looking at another reason for road accidents, one which is even more dangerous. Let us understand another type of distance called the reaction distance. Braking distance is the time it takes for the vehicle to come to a stop after the application of brakes. Here there is one more problem. When are we applying the brakes? When we feel or realize that we need to apply the brakes. Now there is a gap between when we realize that we need to step on the brakes and the time we actually apply the brakes. You are driving your vehicle and you are enjoying the thrill of the speed at which you are moving and then suddenly someone haphazardly crosses the road in front of you. That vision is captured by your eyes. Well, that is for people who have eyes on the road because all these are ideal conditions. Not all of the people have their eyes set on the road while driving. So this sight of the man crossing the road falls on your eyes and then gets sent as a signal to your brain which processes it and informs you that there is a danger. You might crash, you should not crash and then sends a message saying slam your brakes you dope head and this signal has to reach your legs before you can slam that brake. There is some work involved in this. This time is called reaction time. This time between when your brain tells your legs to apply the brakes and the time your legs actually applies them varies from individual to individual, between age groups, between genders and varies as per your condition at the time of driving. Condition here means what is inside you, that is if you are driving after consuming alcohol. The reaction time gets delayed as per the amount of alcohol is inside your body. That is, more the alcohol, the more is your reaction time. A standard reaction time which is universally measured is around 1.5 seconds. So by the time you realize the danger and you slam your brakes, you have already taken 1.5 seconds. So what is the reaction distance? The reaction distance is the distance the car has traveled from the time you detect a hazard until you press the brake pedal or swerve. That is the distance your vehicle has traveled between your reaction time. So we need to consider both these distances. Reaction distance that is the distance traveled due to the reaction time and braking distance. The distance traveled after you apply your brakes. Both these distances put together is called stopping distance. That is the distance a vehicle travels right from when you have observed an obstruction to the distance traveled when you actually stop the vehicle is called stopping distance. In other words, the reaction distance plus braking distance is the stopping distance. Your velocity will determine your braking distance. Remember, when you double your velocity, you double your braking distance and if you increase your speed by three times, the braking distance increases nine times. See this chart. Suppose you are traveling at a speed of 32 km per hour and you suddenly decide to apply the brakes. During your reaction time, taken as an approximate standard at one second, your car will move six meters. At 32 km per hour, your stopping distance is 12 meters. 
that is 6 meters during reaction distance and 6 meters during breaking distance. To make it easier to understand, please keep in mind that if you are traveling at 60 km per hour, you are traveling 22 meters in 1 second. 1, 2. Between these times, your vehicle has traveled 22 meters. As the speed increases, the red bar on that chart keeps increasing. At 32 km per hour, your stopping distance is 12 meters, which is the length of 3 average cars. When you double your speed from 32 km per hour to 64 km per hour, the stopping distance now has increased 3 times to 36 meters, which is the average length of 9 cars put together. Now, if you are traveling at 80 km per hour, the time you notice an obstruction and you actually stop, you would have traveled 53 meters already. Now this statement that you would have traveled 53 meters needs to be looked into carefully. It means that if there was something in between you and 53 meters, you would have crashed into whatever it is in those 53 meters. No one is standing there to clear your path between you and 53 meters ahead when you decide to slam the brakes after seeing a danger. This means that you are bound to crash if you are on a normal road. That number is what our police department notes down as 1.5 lakh deaths or 4.5 lakh injuries in one year. So what is the moral of the story? We said this to make you understand how your speed determines the control that you have on your vehicle. Remember what we said in the first video. The moment the vehicle starts skidding, it is game over. The tires need to roll and for that you need to have static friction on your side. If you are travelling at a high speed, you won't have his or her company for a very long time. So, your speed or velocity determines the control you will have on your vehicle. Also, the braking distance also depends on various other factors such as the condition of the road, weather conditions like wetness or if there is ice on the road, the condition of your tires, the condition of your brakes and of course the size of the vehicle. However, what we have discussed above are under ideal conditions. Real road conditions may differ and your braking distance on a wet or snow covered road will be higher than a normal dry road. There are many reasons why people increase their speeds on roads. Some do it for the thrill. We will not discuss this reason here because we don't have anything to say to such people. Only one thing we have to say to those people is your liberty to swing your fist ends just where my nose begins. So we will exclude those who speed just for the thrill. We will discuss another common genuine reason for speeding which is haste. We normally hurry to avoid delay or because we don't want to get late. Seems a genuine reason. You may miss your train or flight or you might be late for your office etc. Let us go back to school again and a little mathematics. We need to link three things here. One, the distance to your destination. Second, the time it takes to reach the destination. And third, your speed. They are bound by one very simple equation. Using basic school maths, the distance divided by time would give you your speed. Or speed is the distance traveled per time. If you travel 100 kilometers in 2 hours, the speed was 50 kilometers per hour. So using this formula, we can calculate how much time you can gain if you are going to increase your speed. This simple chart that we have made shows this clearly. Let us assume that you have to travel say 30 kilometers. This chart shows how much time you would take if you traveled at 10 kilometers per hour, 20 kilometers per hour, 30 kilometers per hour etc. And it also calculates the difference in time between say traveling at 30 kilometers per hour and 40 kilometers per hour etc. So look at the chart for a 30 km journey. If you increase speed from 70 to 80 km per hour, you stand to gain 
yes rub your eyes and look again 3.2 minutes so today you travel to work which is 30 kilometers away at a speed of 70 kilometers per hour and tomorrow you woke up late by 15 minutes and in order to reach the same office on time you increase your speed to 80 kilometers per hour you would have saved a mere 3.2 minutes your boss is still going to give you an earful for being late on the flip side think about the huge increase in stopping distance when you increase your speed from 70 to 80 you put all your efforts to increase your speed and gun the pedal down for what to save 3.2 minutes of your life look at the chart again we have put the normal distances that people travel in a day and have plotted it against the time taken and the time that you actually gain. Look at the bottom right corner. To travel a distance of 300 kilometers, if you traveled at a speed of 100 kilometers per hour instead of the normal highway speed limit of 80 kilometers per hour, you would save 45 minutes over 300 kilometers. Now think, if it is worth all the effort and weigh it against what would happen if a person or for that matter a dog decided to take a leisurely walk across your path and you have to slam the brake to prevent dashing into it. The moral of the story is the time you gain is very minimal and the dangers associated with speeding increases many folds. Now think about the people who zoom past you on roads and think about the risk they are increasing in terms of increasing their stopping distance and how much ignorable time they will gain. Now, if you were to take another statistics, you will even see this reversing. Now, let me give you an actual life example. During my childhood, I used to travel in a school bus. It had two drivers. One was a young fellow and the other was an old ex-military driver. One drove slow and calm while the other drove fast. No prices for guessing which one was which. Now, as a child, most of us were a fan of this young chap who drove fast and we often looked with pity at the other driver. I remember that some of us used to fight to sit in front to enjoy the thrill. It was an art seeing the young guy pull the gear and race the bus along the road. It was a spectacle just to watch him drive. Many actually idolized him. But on the days when we saw the old driver uncle, as we used to call him, our hopes would be dashed. Uncle would keep dragging through the roads, depriving us of the thrill of racing. We often thought that the young driver would invariably make us reach the school faster. We did have some fans of the older guy because they didn't want to reach school any faster than what they could. Pack benches. Looking back, it wasn't the prospect of reaching school faster which made us like the flying driver. It was a thrill of speeding on the road. Those were carefree days when we didn't have much clue about science and science was most often theorems and formulae by hearted. However, it was much later in our school lives that we realized that even with the obvious difference in the driving styles, both the drivers usually reach the school almost at the same time. It has happened sometimes that the slow driver uncle reached the school earlier than the young fellow. We didn't have a direct comparison as only one would be driving on a particular day. But when we looked at the time it took, we realized that they almost took the same amount of time. How was this possible? How can the uncle who drags the bus be able to reach the school taking the same time as the flying chetan. Today, I have the answer. For this, we need to first understand the difference between speed and acceleration. Speed is the distance covered in unit of time while acceleration is the rate of change of speed. If you are on a flight and it is on cruise mode, you may have noticed that even if the flight is traveling at 800 km per hour, you don't feel a thing and you can do anything standing inside. That is because even though the speed is on the higher side, the acceleration is not changing. 
you can throw a ball up and catch it. Drink a coffee without spilling. Now you understand why we call the pedal as accelerator in vehicles. When you turn the accelerator on a bike or step on the gas pedal and keep it there in that position, you are not maintaining the speed in that position. You are maintaining the acceleration at that position. The speed will continue to increase. What we feel is the rate of change of speed or acceleration. When we go to an amusement park and take those rides, we experience the thrill caused due to acceleration. And that is why when you go in an 800 km per hour speed flight, there is no thrill, but you get thrilled in much lesser speed at amusement parks. Acceleration is directly connected to the force and hence our body understands and feels this and this is why you go back a little when the bus suddenly starts and you don't move an inch while it is moving continuously. So our bodies can sense this acceleration or the opposite deceleration quite quickly but when moving at a constant speed we don't notice anything. People who have flown would have realized this. When the flight is taking off, the flight accelerates very fast. It would be within a few seconds that the velocity of the flight increases from 0 to 300 or 400 km per hour. So many tend to feel nervous during this time as this is what the body feels. Once the flight enters the cruise mode or steady speed, you don't even realize that you are zooming around at 800 km per hour. Driving on Indian roads require a special skill. That is one of the reasons why films like Mission Impossible or Fast and Furious doesn't evoke the same effect on Indians like it does for Americans. We don't have the same awe for the racing stunts depicted in those movies. We see such stunts daily on our roads. For us, it is part of our daily life whereas for the Americans, it is a bike or a car stunt. I still wonder how did the Doom franchise survive for three movies in India? I think one of the reasons why the circus industry has almost died off in India is because the circus acts don't amaze us anymore. We see better daredevilry on our highways. A family of four with the seven-year-old son standing in front of the dad riding a scooter with the four-year-old son dancing in between the dad and mom and the mom is holding two heavy bags of groceries from the supermarket on both sides and riding on pothole roads of ours without a helmet and going zing zing. In front of this, a circus act of riding a unicycle and catching a hat thrown in the air pales in comparison. So having understood this, let us go back to my two school bus drivers. Things to note here is that the route which both these drivers travelled is not straight. There are a lot of turns. Then there will be a lot of obstructions in between like other vehicles, traffic signals, etc. So the fast driver cannot consistently be on a fast drive. He needs to keep changing his speed and thus his acceleration as per the turns on the roads and other obstructions. While he accelerates, we feel that he is driving fast, whereas the slow driver uncle is at a more constant speed and low acceleration. The overall time taken is decided by the average speed. You are driving fast and just in front is a slow moving auto rickshaw. So you apply the brakes and you decelerate just as fast as you accelerated. So the average speed of both these drivers will not vary much. Like if the fast driver travels at 10, 20, 30, 40 and 50 km per hour and the slow driver at 20 to 25 km per hour, there will not be much difference in both the driver's average speeds. But as children, what we noticed is that when the fast driver was accelerating, we felt the thrill but we missed that he was decelerating just as many number of times due to obstructions on the road. The fast driver may at many points need to suddenly brake whereas the slow driver can see things ahead and has more time to change his speed if required and make small adjustments with less requirement of sudden stops. 
so his average speed continues to remain almost the same whereas the average speed of the fast driver comes down drastically that is the reason why they both managed to make us reach the school around the same time next time you are in a hurry think of this story i don't think we need to mention the moral here do we so if we were to combine all the morals of this story this is what we will get respect and keep the speed limit the speed limit on roads is calculated by looking at the number of vehicles on the road and what is the available stopping distance wherein you can safely stop without crashing into another vehicle normally the speed limit on our highways is 80 kilometers per hour by speeding over the speed limit is just going to increase your chances of getting your picture on the wall or the next day's newspaper and it is not going to give you any substantial time saving the risk involved at high speeds is absolutely not worth when compared to the time gained due to over speed you are just decreasing the time you get to live on this earth practice leaving early at your destination so that you don't end up being late and drive within the speed limit else you will be leaving early from life number 2 remember coefficient of friction who is the hero of the story be wary of rainwater sand etc on road the coefficient of friction on a wet road is lesser than the coefficient of friction on a dry road so if you usually travel at 60 km per hour during rain travel at around 30 to 35 km per hour max that is the rule of the thumb also consider the conditions of the road always remember the conditions in which we are living look out for humps on the road we don't have the practice of demarcating the humps on road with white lines or with sign boards always they can appear out of the black with no warning whatsoever people who have traveled from bangalore to kur on the highway would most certainly understand what i am trying to say number 3 know the limitations of your vehicle you can't do what an innova can do with a maruti 800 or an alto you may get similar speeds but a maruti 800 will not stop where an innova would there is difference in design and friction know what your vehicle is designed for remember what all you can do with your vehicle only then should you think if you want to take a risk or not the stopping distance of an innova and an alto would differ and if you take a look at the cars which are looking like they are climbing up the lamp post on the sides of the road you would see that they are always smaller or lighter cars like swift alto etc no offense meant to any car manufacturer here it is just that those smaller cars are not designed for speeding and acrobatics they may speed but they won't stop when you want them to stop when you slam the brakes the tires would stop but what we really want is to stop the vehicle that may not happen as easily with lighter vehicles number 4 keep your reaction time short hope you understood this it simply means don't drink and drive when you are intoxicated your reaction time increases and depending on the capacity of the people the reaction time may increase from 1 to 2 to 3 seconds within that time your car would have traveled many meters before stopping also don't drive when you're tired or sleepy and most importantly keep your eyes on the road however interesting the views on the road is beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder and not in the holder of the steering wheel and mobile phones it's a strict no no keep your tires brakes and shock absorbers in condition bad tire less friction condition of your brakes is self explanatory most people think shock absorbers are only there for the comfort of the commuters to lessen the shocks when riding pothole roads no its primary purpose is to keep the tire always in contact with the road surface only if there is contact there can be static friction 
and only if there is static friction can you maneuver your vehicle well enough. If you lose contact with the road, you would turn the steering, the tires would also turn, but the vehicle would not turn. So shock absorbers are a very important component. Number seven, always use a seat belt. Why is this important? We need a little more time to explain this. So we will talk about it in our next video. We most often see many people zooming across our roads as if they have a flight to catch. The point that we are trying to make with signs and factual numbers is that you are not going to gain much time by speeding. But it makes a difference to whether you want to wake up tomorrow morning or be on the wall with some flowers and agarbatis. In the next part, which will be the concluding part, we will look at how science has helped to reduce the accidents or reduce the impact of such accidents. We will explain how you can use science to keep away from most accidents. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so now so that you don't miss the next part. Also, if and only if you liked our content, click on the like button and share our videos. We will be back soon with more science behind accidents. Till then, it's bye-bye from Pale Blue Thoughts and kill your speed before it kills you.